a good, good father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Out of the eater come forth sweetness. I've been going over that sermon in my mind most of the day today. I know I spent a long time with it this morning. A couple of people said, boy, you preached a long time. You don't know. I wanted to preach about 30 minutes longer. Amen. So praise God for what you got. Praise the Lord. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. Every time somebody pops up on that live stream and says, you don't know what that did for my soul. Praise God. It's worth it. There is a price to pay if we are going to see a move of God. You, you don't get that by being haphazard. You don't get that by simply just muddle along into it. It is a conscious decision that you're going to do, just like these prayer times. Amen. And, and, and I just, again, I thank God for every one of you that are so faithful to these times of prayer. If you're listening by live stream, I thank God for those of you that are faithful Man, whenever that you couldn't be here, you're not able to be here. Some of them closed and, you know, all of that. Title of the sermon tonight is one that's very familiar. I have spoke on this subject before, but tonight I just feel led to the Lord to talk about it again. Because of so many things are said today, which do you prefer? Which do you prefer? The heat of the desert? Or the safety of the slave camp? Which one would you rather have? Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Amen. Second book of the Bible. Moses has been called by God. God's talking to him. Amen. And I'm already into that. I'm in my personal Bible study right now. It's so beginning the first year again on the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm, I'm reading seven chapters a day, four in the Old Testament, three in the New. And that's just my habit, and I feel like it's a good habit. Praise God. I probably, I don't know, probably 30 times that I've read the Bible through, and some of you probably read it through more than me and never talked about it. But I find it interesting. I am finding that as we are praying that suddenly... It's all interesting. It's all brand new to me. A guy told me down at the post office a while back, he said, I just can't see reading the Bible the way y'all do. Over and over. He said, I read a book and it's just done with. I never read it again. He said, even if I like Westerns, I read a Western, throw it away or give it to somebody. Said, Let me tell you something. You've ever read the Bible through? And he said, oh, no. I said, you ain't talking about a regular book. You're talking about the book of life. You're talking about the word of the living God. And I said, I can tell you this. I said, after reading parts of it hundreds of times, I've read the Bible through on purpose probably 30, 35 times, something like that. But there's parts of it I've read hundreds of times. Amen. Every month I read the book of Proverbs through. Every day I read the chapter. Amen. Today's 19th. I read the 19th chapter before I come to church this morning. I try to study. I try to deal with those things that it's saying it's brand new to me I see things I've never seen before I see I, I, God through the Holy Ghost will give you insights that you've never had you see things just like what I told you this morning I was talking about the word tempest i would never seen pest in tempest before praise God but there is certainly in our spiritual walk we go through trials and we go through storms and they're called tempest and they're full of pest. Amen. But God delivers from that. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Can I let you in on something? God knows where you're at. 
God knows what you're going through. God knows everything about you. There is nothing hidden from God. He knows the sorrows. That's true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. And we're living in those New Testament days. Listen to what God said. And I'm come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land unto a good land and large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. My daddy was preaching on that one time, and he said, and he's taking us out of the land of the backbites. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He did that. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians have oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Father, I give this to you. I give this sermon to you tonight. I only want to be obedient to you and the things that you want me to say. Help me to say what you want me to say. Help me to do your santa rabahatai. In Jesus' holy name, I surrender all to you. Praise God. I preached the message. It's not tonight, but I preached this on these same verses of Scripture. God said, I'm coming down, and they're coming out. As God declared unto the man of God, the man of God obeyed him. And amen, you'll find out that Pharaoh hardens his heart and said, Who's God that I should listen to him? But God said, I'm coming down. They're coming out. And after God laid waste to Egypt, and this was something that came to me just a few months ago, why did the children of Israel borrow? And, and I'm, I'm looking at that word borrow, and I'm saying it borrowed, and the Bible said that God gave them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, but they went and borrowed. I'm, to my thinking, I'm always saying, if you borrow something, you've got to give it back. And they never did give it back. And the Bible said they literally, and you can find this in the original Hebrew and to read what the scholars said, they actually bankrupt Egypt when they left there. Why well, do you know where they had all the gold? They borrowed it off of those Egyptians. Where did they have all the skins and all the badger skins and everything else to do and build the tabernacle and put the gold over all the shaitan wood and all of that? Where did they get that? They borrowed it off the Egyptians. But that wasn't right. Oh, yes, it was right because the Egyptians had been working them for nothing. And God is a God of justice, and he said that they ought to always pay your bills. Amen. And if you work for labor, you ought to get paid for that. And if somebody's working for you, you ought to pay them when they're working for you and give them a just way, just what the Bible says about it. Amen. That's good preaching right in itself. So they got paid for 400 years of hard work. God said, I'm coming down. They're coming out after 400 years of bondage. The time has come for these people of God to be delivered out of the hands of their enemies. When God told Moses, said, I, have, I am, has sent you, he was saying this. He said, I'll be everything that I have to be when you're in Egypt, Moses. You're coming out of that land of Midian. You've been over there for 40 years. You started out in Egypt. That's where you was born. That's where you was educated. That's where you was trained as a soldier. He said, but you're out of that now, boy. You've been over there. Had you over there for 40 years. But you come coming now. And he said, whatever I have to be to deliver them because that is my declaration. That's what I'm going to be. Oh, bless God. Wow, God's going to be. What do you get out of that? Tell me I got this one on too. What do you get out of that? Here's what I get out of that. Everything that we need God to be in mind in your life, when we're walking according to what God says we ought to walk in, when we're doing what God says we ought to do, Amen. If I'm pastor of this church because I'm led by the Holy Ghost to pastor this church, he's going to be with me. We're dealing with Raven's ministries. We feel that's a ministry from God. If it's God that's leading us, bless God, he's going to be in it. We're taking care of the widows up here on the hill. By the way, we've got on, on uh, January the 30th, we've set that date that, that Christian life's going to be here, Brother Kurt. We're going to uh, dedicate everything uh, uh, to the Lord up there and, and, and get those widows in and we just praise God and very little to be done just some paperwork to get God is good but if God's in it God's going to be everything to me and you 
that he needs to be to see that we get done what he said he wants done. You see, you got to understand when God's in it, God finances it. When God's in it, God deals with it. Amen. When God's in it, God will give us the understanding of how to tweak things so it'll be done his way and the way he wants it to be done. I'll be everything that I need to be for you. The people of God had been slaves for so long, they had almost forgotten that they were slaves. Oh, when you look at that, folk, you take that in the natural and put it in the spiritual sense. Amen? You begin to see what I'm getting at here. Spiritually speaking, the greatest tragedy of life is to get into a rut religiously. How do you know, preacher? Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt while I was at the rut convention. What is a rut? I like what an old preacher said years ago. You know what a religious rut is? It's only a grave with both ends kicked out of it. Praise God. You're dead and don't know it. You're in a rut. Guy come to me a while back and he said, Preacher, I'm in a rut. I said, you are? He said, yeah, religiously I'm in a rut. I said, son, you're dead? He said, no, I'm not dead. I said, oh, yeah, you are. So I gave him that message. Praise God. People gets in a rut. That, that, that's a horrible life to live in. It's a great tragedy. I've been there, done that again. But so often people live there so long that they mistake death for life. That's the tragedy. When we think that, oh, just everything is going smooth and just this, 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 and this is okay and this and this and this has happened. And boy, this is great. When it ain't great, we in a religious rut. We're really dead and don't know it. Such people feel that everything is fine when everything is already lost. God spoke to my heart a while back and he said, Son, my people are living so far below their means and potential. They're living so far below their blessings. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, people, people will come to me. I'm going to tell you something, folk, I've learned about in a financial difficulty, you can tithe your way out of that. You're in a, you're in a difficulty financially, you can give your way out of that. I done, I done been in this too long to know, amen, anything different. Somebody asked me a while back, said, Preacher, we need to do this and that and the other about, you know, the finances. I got a call the other day. Fellow one of finance. He said, Well, I, I'm a finance. I said, I got the book on finances. Praise God. I know how it's done. I know how things are taken care of. Praise God. Oh, amen. How many churches in our time have gotten into a rut and are so lifeless? So many organizations and, and, and trying to get everything organized. They get into such a form that they hinder a true revival. It's easy to allow our minds to become deadened by the system that is going on. Too often you can't prove anything to that type of person that's in a religious rut that anything is even wrong in the first place. Oh, listen to me. I've seen people sit in the pew. They're active in church. Amen. But yet they are so far away from true revival. Amen. These are the most difficult people in the world to ever reach with the true gospel to ever touch. God, whoever God knows, amen, I'm telling you, and whoever really knows God desires true revival of God in their midst, in their lives, in their family, in their church, in their community, in their county, in their state. Oh, glory to God. Oh, but when people... That same ones who profess they want a move of God. When they see what it really cost. Can I tell you something? I, again, I'm going to say this in all humility. I truly, deeply appreciate every one of you that's been so faithful to these prayer meetings. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of other people that could have been here and just chose not to be. Amen. Some couldn't be. Some have told me we are praying at home. And I believe them. Because they told me that. I have no reason not to believe them. They told me I'm praise God. But others, folk, others have told me, well, you know, I just really don't think you have to do that. One, one guy told me, he said, I'm praying home. I said, sure can. He said, thank you. He grinned. I said, are you? Uh, uh. I knew by the first uh, he wasn't praying. Amen. 
Can I tell you something? You can do a lot of things if you want to, but are you doing them? One guy told me a while back, he said, Preacher, I can serve God at home. I said, sure can. Are you? Uh, well, yeah. I said, where are you paying your tithe? Uh, well, uh, uh, I said, James. Strike an inch. I said, what are you doing about the Great Commission? Uh, uh, I said, Jesus said, that's a command. That is not a proposition. So, well, if you do, if you will, if, if, if. Don't act like Daffy Duck. Amen. Either we are or we ain't. Sure, you can, you can serve God at home, but are you? Who are you visiting in the hospital? Uh, I knew that was another strike against him. I'm running out of fingers. I don't want to pull my shoes off. I want to tell you, we can do a lot, but are we? Let me let you in on something, friends. The church is not my ideal. The church is God's ideal. It's God's ideal. So, Gwen, I appreciate you. We're talking about, and we're using an analogy here, they're in the slave camp. What does it really cost? I want to tell you, interest in a true revival dissipates quickly whenever people learn that it's going to cost them something. I want to tell you, you know, Moses here, he's the man that God has used to bring revival into that land. He's a hero in the beginning. Oh, people want to make him a king. Oh, I'm telling you. You tell people today what God has shown you and God wants to send revival. People will get excited. They'll get stirred. Yes, sir. Amen. They're ready to dance a little jig. They're ready to get in on it. But when you tell them, amen, that we're going to, God showed you for a, for a true move of God, we're going to have some all-night prayer meetings. I'm going to tell you they'll saturate this place with their absence. Amen. Ain't going to, ain't going to pray no all-night preacher. Uh, you went a little far. Some of y'all already getting a little nervous, I can tell. Amen. You already went a little far. Amen. This 21 days, you went higher day. All night. I remember a time that we had all night prayer meetings here. Didn't have but about seven or eight. Maybe nine, ten. I remember one time we, we really broke a record. Had a lamp. All night long. I mean, we come in here at nine o'clock and we prayed until the sun come up. Oh, did you do it? Yeah, I mean, I heard some things I'd never heard before. One fellow laid flat of his face, and he prayed for a long time. And he prayed in tongues for a long time. Then he got quiet, and then there was a new voice come out. <laughs> Amen. I said, how in the world is he laying on that flat, on that floor? Amen. A couple of the guys looked at me. I just went over and shook him. I said, brother, turn over. I've got to get you in another language. Oh, Amen. Praise God. All night prayer meetings, they ain't easy. I can tell you that. But we saw God move in a great way. It's in the book, honey bunch. I'm not giving you anything else. You're getting fanatic, preacher. You got that right. Amen. You, you can lose a whole crowd in a heartbeat. Moses stepped into Egypt. Amen. And he, he found them already ready to you know, promote him, make him a king. I, I'm telling you, 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 can, you can really pat a man on the back, stands up to the president. You hear me? Stands up to the governor when the governor ain't doing right and he goes in for you. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, he stands up to Pharaoh for them. They patting him on the back. Man, you the man. I'm telling you. They go marching out of Egypt. The Bible said there was not one feeble soul among them. They wasn't the first cart had somebody being hauled because they were crippled. There was not the first one that had a cane. Nobody had a crutch. They're marching out of there. There are 600,000 men that are marching out of there that are in the army. That was from like 18 years of age up to around 30 or 40 years of age at that time that they served in the military. There's a lot of older men and women. There was a lot of younger kids. There was a lot of people in between. There was a lot of girls and, and amen and all this and that and the other. And the Levites didn't serve in that. There's thousands of them. Amen. So scholars tell us there's approximately 3 million people. That, and that's besides donkeys. That is besides camels. That is besides cattle. That is besides sheep and goats. Amen. And if there's turkeys over there, they had some turkeys in there too. Praise God. Not spiritually. Amen. There's a crowd going out there. They leave out there. Everybody's happy. Oh, I'm telling you, God's moving today, getting the church ready. 
Amen. They're excited. Can I tell you something? God's getting excited about this church. God's getting excited about the day and hour we're living in. Amen. The second coming of Jesus Christ is upon us. Amen. It's time to get rid of all these personal things. It's time to get rid of all these selfish motivations. It's time to get rid of all that because he's coming again. And I don't want to miss it. You can miss it if you want to. Take over this pastorate. Go down there to the corner of Groundhog and 83 and take over that house because me and my little woman's going to be gone. Second coming. God's got a church that's moving. I hope you're listening. People's spirits are starting to open up. Amen. We can shout down walls. Oh, glory to God and expectation of what God is doing. But hear me, folk. They're marching out. And before we face it, I heard a guy describing the time before the rapture of the church, and he said, oh, he said it's going to be one of the greatest times, it's going to be one of the smoothest times. We're just going to make the church a pure utopia and then invite Jesus back. Baloney. I'm going to tell you, them boys is heading, them women's are heading, that sheep is a heading for the promised land. But between them and the promised land is a desert, one of the hottest places on the face of this earth when the average temperature in most days is 110 degrees. The sand is burning. It's hot. It's arid. I mean, they ain't no water. They ain't no greenery. They're going through a desert. It's true in the natural. It's true in the spirit. Huh. They're walking out of there, but the bitter waters of Myra is coming. The scorching heat of the desert, amen, is just ahead of him. They get in the middle of that desert, and I want to tell you what happens. A bunch of them is getting ready to return to the slave camp. How many times did they say, oh, God, I wish we'd never left Egypt? Praise God. King David, you remember him? Got ready to bring the Ark of the Covenant in to the children of Israel. He'd been gone for so long. He said, hey, he said, let's do it. Everybody shouts amen, amen, brother, let's do it. Everybody shouting, they're going along dancing, they're sacrificing, they're excited until a man falls dead from disobedience. What happened? Everybody got mad at God. They got afraid of God and then they got mad at God. I've often said, and I believe this is coming, I believe in the last days that God is going to give us an acts of the apostle revival. But y'all better get ready because when, if we really get, I mean, a dose of the true power of God, when Sapphire and Ananias steps up and starts their ignorance, they're going to fall dead. One, we can get by with, even if it's on live stream when he comes up to drop it in. Y'all see that on live stream? Nobody shot him. Just stay all dead right there, family worship, right in front of the altar. Praise God. Amen. Sunday morning service. Got everything to get ready and going to have service. Yeah, preacher said they're going to have service. Come on Sunday night. Amen. Sapphire. And a nice rather. Dead. Sapphire has been out in Charleston shopping. She don't know exactly what's happened. Because Aunt Nice said she could, he gonna take care of the morning service. She comes strutting up to the altar and play, hey, is that what y'all promised? Yeah, it's what we promised to God. Why in the world you lying to God for? Boom, fell down dead. Amen. I want to tell you, friend, with or without live stream, they're going to be some investigators in here. They're going to be saying, what in the world is going on? Ain't nothing going on. Can you imagine that? They write it down. He said nothing's going on. He said it's a Holy Ghost revival. First thing they're going to do is carry that bottle of oil out of here. They're going to do a dialysis on Diagnostic, I'm gonna die. Diagnostic test. Amen. They, they, they're gonna figure out what's in that. Praise God. Amen. Oh, glory to God. It ain't just anybody. A lot of people to blame that on the Lord. That's my stupidity. Praise God. An analysis is what I was meant to say. An analysis on that. They're gonna figure out what's in it. That's what one person told you one time. said, don't ever let Charlie Rose put that greasy stuff on your head. There's some kind of drug in that. And when it hits you, you'll fall in the floor and talk funny. <laughs> said that. That's what they told on us. Revival's coming. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Oh, I'm going to tell you. That old boy fell dead from disobedience, bringing that Ark of the Covenant back. Everybody's ready to go somewhere else to church. They ain't staying in that place. 
Praise God. Three million people, they're coming out of there. Oh, I'm telling you what, they left there with gold. There's a jingling in their pockets. The earrings is in the money sack. Oh, them old gals is coming out of there. They walking out of Egypt. Hey, Amen. They was healthy, but they was walking lopsided, carrying my gold and my silver. Bless God. Hey, Amen. How you like my new fancy boots? Hey, Amen. Them's Egyptian made. Glory to God. How you like these breeches? Them's Egyptian made. Come on out of Pharaoh's household. One of his servants got scared and let me have them. Oh, they're out of there. They're walking. Oh, praise God. 400 years of slavery is open. Behind them, the nation, amen, uh, uh, of, of Egypt lies in ruins. They're stepping out with high hopes, amen. The people are on the march. They're excited about everything. Oh, <laughs> it ain't but just a few hours away. Amen. God, Moses, you didn't tell me. My feet's going to burn like this. I can see old Cory and a bunch of his bunch jumping around like a cat on a hot tin roof. Praise God. Everything's a burning me. Everything's a bother me. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be this bad. Hey, Ben, we don't have no fans like my air conditioners quit. No, honey, it's 110. Your perm's going to run down in your face. Your mascara's going to melt. Your lipstick's going to run down. You're going to look like Dracula on a bad day. I'm going to tell you, everything is looking bad. You're in the heat of the battle. Praise God. I think, y'all, I don't think a Sunday morning crowd can handle this. <laughs> I'm glad for you all. Praise God. Amen. Complaints. I took a sip of that water, and it's not the sin I... I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you, I took a drink of it and I puckered down to my goozle. The water's bitter. It's awful. Amen. You know what I thought? I, I thought, Brother Tommy, that Moses was a good man. I believe he's a con man. He got us for all this is going to get us out here in the desert and get us all killed and take all the money and he'll be living somewhere high and dry, that dirty dog. Hello, oh, Charlie Rose is all right. I believe he's a pure crook. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Trust me, I have been called much worse. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Sharon just smiles and she says, I'm not him. No, but you married him. Praise God. So you're in on it. Praise God. Amen. They preferred the camp of a religious system that would cost them nothing than a real move of God that would cost them everything. Everything. A young man came through here a few years ago from out of Minnesota, I think it was, riding a motorcycle, took up with a young lady here in the area, rode up and down the road, come to Raven's ministry. We fed him a couple times, started coming to church. And he'd come and he'd sit back and he wouldn't talk to anybody. Didn't want to talk to anybody. Said he was mean. Might have been. Didn't look like he's big enough to be mean, but said he was. Amen. He come and listen to me preach one service, listen to Johnny Cooper preach the other service. We was taking turns back in those days. One night he said, can I talk to you preachers? Had the altar service. We were not here. We was upstairs. We come downstairs with him. Had that motorcycle helmet on that black leather. And he said, what have I got to do to get saved? Johnny began to tell him. He said, I just let Johnny talk. Johnny's doing a good job. I didn't need to interrupt him. I mean, he's telling him the plan of salvation. He said, what's it going to cost me? I knew that was my cue. I said, everything, son. He said, what? I said, everything. I said, let me tell you a story. I said, the story is Jesus told himself about a man's plow in the field. He'd been hired to plow that field. In the middle of that, y'all ever used a horse and plow? I'm going to tell you they're different. Amen. You're going along. You got them rings around your neck. You're trying to keep that thing, and especially if you've got you a balking old mule on your side. Amen. One minute that rascal will pull, the next minute you've got to beat him half to death to get him moving. One old fella said, don't way get his mule to plow. He'd walk up to it, and before he ever, when he hooked him up to the plow, 
He'd walk around. They said this true story. He'd take a big old broomstick and hit him right between the eyes as hard as he could. And that buddy, his neighbor, said, why'd you do that? He said, that's the only way he'll plow. Got to get his attention. He's got his attention now. He'll plow. The old mule, both eyes crossed. He didn't know but enough just to plow. Amen. Man, that knocked him senseless. Amen. He's a plowing out in the middle of that field, and all of a sudden he hits something. I used to follow along with Daddy. Daddy had a little old piece of leather strapped on to the side of that plow. Had a big sharp hatchet on it. And I'm telling you, you didn't want to miss nothing with that. You cut your toe off in a heartbeat. Daddy could shave with his hatchet. I got it now. It's in my garage. Amen. Go along. Hey, Daddy would stop. He's a teaching me something. He stopped. Whoa, whoa, back up. Whoa. Gets there. He said, cut that root out, boy. I'm down on my hands and knees. I said, can you see it? He said, take your hands. Get it out of there. I'm going to tell you, come home. Amen. I've got, I've got all kinds of grime under there. Amen. It's good, healthy dirt. I learned to love the smell of dirt. I learned to love the smell, amen, of those roots whenever you get cut. Amen. You, you, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, sassafras, amen, and that odor of, of, of fresh plowed dirt. I'm telling you, it's unlike anything else, and sassafras tea is mighty fine for you, folks. I wouldn't boil that stuff. I know you're missing out on good stuff in life. I'll get to you in a minute. Hey, man, but I'm just going to tell you. Hey, man, he hits something. He thinks it's a root. I can see it. Whoa. Pulls that ox or that mule or that horse, whatever he's a plowing with, lays it aside, tries to get down there to the root, and all of a sudden he finds a chest in there. Oh, man, he pulls it out. Locks rusty. He gets her unlocked, opens it up. He's dazzled in that 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 east, that Middle Eastern sun, sparkling on them diamonds, sparkling on that gold, and those bracelets and everything else. He said, Woo-wee. Well, he's halfway honest. He's honest anyway. He buries it back in the dirt. He don't go tell that rascal. He's probably done cheated him a few times out of his payday. He goes home and he starts setting everything out. He tells the owner, said, I'll be back tomorrow to finish everything. Where are you going? Got some family business got to take care of. The wife gets, gets back in from shopping and he's got all the furniture set out in the yard. He's got a big old sign up that says yard sale. Hey, man, I mean, he's selling everything he's got. He's already sold that little wagon the little kids have got. He sold everything. Hey, man, he sold the bed. He sold the refrigerator. Hey, man, he sold his lawn. He sold his house. Hey, man, he sold his wardrobe. He sold everything. She said, why don't you get to keep it? He said, what you got on? That's it. She goes, changes into the best she's got because the great fan man's went crazy. But she has to obey him because that's the way it used to be. Women used to obey their husbands. Wow. Amen. They sell everything. I just, my mind went back to the old days for a second. Amen. We'll get some. Oh, yeah, I got back in a hurry. I looked down the chair and that was all good. <laughs> Praise God. He sells everything. He said, listen, little darling, trust me. But you sold the girls Barbies. It's okay. You sold little Johnny's slingshot. It's okay. Amen. Little Johnny's getting ready to get a BB gun. Oh, he sells everything he's got. He goes to that old tightwad owner and he says, I'd like to buy that field I'm a plow. Cost you sold. So just happened to have it in my hand to sign the papers. He goes back. He gets more than he ever bargained for. Jesus tells about the guy with the pearl of great price. Same story. That guy told me, this is going to cost me everything. This is going to cost you everything. He said, I ain't got nothing but this helmet and my jacket and a motorcycle. I said, oh, you got something else that's going to take you, son. I said, you got pride. I said, you got, you done told me you mean. I said, it's going to take that mean spirit you got. It's going to take that temper out of you. It's going to take all those things. I don't know what caused you to leave Minnesota, but I'm going to tell you, wherever you ended up at, you ended up in a different spot than Minnesota. He said, I know that. I said, it's going to cost you. I said, whatever it is, it's going to cost you. Amen. Moses already told him. Oh, that con man's already said. Oh, what's it going to cost us, preacher? It's going to cost us everything. Amen. Do we have to do that? To, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to get rid of everything. Who wouldn't want to move a God that cost them nothing? 
And that's what I hear preachers promising today. They promise on TV. You really want a move of God, it won't cost you anything. Of course, at the end of the service, he's going to tell you that he does want something out of you. He wants to build a pie in the sky and use your dough to do it with. Amen. Revival costs the death of what we are to resurrect us into what God wants us to be. Very few willingness, or, or, or very few are willing to stand the heat of the desert to see a true revival. How many times did people who shouted on the banks of the Red Sea try to go back to Egypt? At one time, they even tried to get them a captain to lead a group back. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm, I'm on a journey to see God like I've never seen him before, to feel God like I've never felt him before, to, to, to sense, amen. But I realize this, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be warfare. How many of you can say already in a test? I know we just got two more nights, and you know, of the 21 days of fast and prayer to schedule for the church individually, and some are finishing up, amen, Tuesday night of 40 days they've already done. I didn't know that. Well, it's none of your business between them and God. That's why you didn't know it. Amen. I'm privileged because I'm pastor. And that's the difference between me and you. There's no difference between me. Yeah, there is. Physically, I'm no different than you. Financially, you may be better than me. You may be worse. But when it comes to the office of this pastorate here, there is a difference between me and you. It's like I told one fellow. He said, well, I don't have any respect for you. I said, well, good. You need to go to another church. He said, what? I said, if you can't respect me, you better respect the office I've got. And if you've lost all respect for me as a minister of the gospel, you do not need to be here because I'm not leaving. So he left. I've been happy. Don't know about him. But I can tell you that's the way it works. Amen. I want to go back to Egypt. There's going to be a warfare. There are going to be times when you've got to fast and pray. There are going to be times you've got to do that. When God tells you to march, you've got to march. When God says, lay down the marching stick and pick up your sword, you're going to have to fight. You've got to do it. Because God's talking. Amen. If we're going to march, we're going to build the church. There will be storms. Souls will be won or lost according to mine and your dedication. I already had somebody to say, Preacher, I don't really care much for that prayer list you got. Number one, that prayer list was designed not by Charlie Rose or Wendy Adams or anybody else designed but God. God spoke to my heart and said, I want you to have 21 days of fasting and prayer. And I want you to allow them to give their prayer request. And I want you to give a copy to everybody. So if you don't like that list, argue it out with God. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're out of sync. You're synchronized with the rest of what God wants done. So there's always going to be a problem. Amen. Souls are going to be won or lost according to our dedication. We've got to get shod. What's well, shod? That's good shoes on. Shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're going somewhere. I said we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Me and Sharon own 13 acres of land that's right upside that mountain except for a couple acres down there where the house and stuff is at. And we keep looking up the side of that mountain because there is a flat place up on the side of that mountain. Amen. Sharon and I were out the other day looking up the side of the mountain. You had to live on top of the mountain. Don't give it up. You regret it like I have. There's just something about the top of the mountain. There's something about the head of the holler, Tommy. Don't give that up. There's something about it, brother. Amen. Sharon was looking up there and she said, if we can lose some more weight, I think I can walk up there. We did 10 years ago. Praise God. I said, baby doll, right now I feel like that I can make it up there. Well, I got a feeling when I get right there, I'm going to say, bye-bye, baby, you go on up. <laughs> She's going to make it up there. But I'm going to get her up there because I'm going to save my money up put a bulldozer road up there. Then borrow one of y'all's four-wheeler to take her up there. Praise God. Amen. I'm telling you, we're going somewhere. We got to get in shape. 
spiritually speaking. We got to get the right kind of shoes on. We're getting ready to go somewhere for the glory of God. And I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be troubles and there's going to be trials and there, there, there's going to be manna that's going to fall. Amen. We're going to enjoy eating, but when we get through eating and head out that door, there's going to be a devil waiting on you. I'd rather be in that situation than I would be interrupted. Amen. I'd rather, if they lay me out here next month, I'd rather have people come by and say, is he really dead? He was wild. Amen. We, we didn't know where he was going to. I'd rather have that 10 to 1 as have some sanctimonious person stand up here and say, I'm glad that Sister Rose called me. Her dear brother has labored here so long. But God has now called him on home. God, no. Amen. No, no, no. No, no. Praise God. Get somebody singing. I saw the light. Amen. Get something moving here. Amen. Amen. Tell Alan not to sit down until he's done prayed us through. Glory to God. Somebody comes out of the seat. Glory to God. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen. Amen. Canaan land is at the end of our journey. What about the leeks and the garlics? What about them? Sure, they're good. But they're back in Egypt. And I'd rather have the manna, the angel food. I'd rather have on my heart and mind what's ahead in the promised land as I would everything back in Egypt. Oh, glory to day for all son, daughter, and young die. Amen. There's an uncommitted congregation that's always going to lust after what's back in Egypt. Moses got so desperately tired in the middle of that desert one time he wished he had never seen them people. <laughs> Amen. You follow the voice and the vision of God and on the hills of that hell is going to talk to you in the middle of the fire. Where's your God? Why did God answer you six months ago but you can't hear him today? I was praying to God recently about some situations. I just talked, this is about me. I said, oh God, I was out back of my house and I was walking, I fixed my fire and I prayed. I pray over my food. Amen. I pray. I stack my wood and praying. I'm driving down the road. I rarely ever turn the radio on. I don't put. I don't even have a CD player. I'm Sharon Strutt. My grandson told me what I could do to get all kinds of gospel music. Don't cost that much. I ain't doing it. I pray. Preacher, what you got to pray about? You one thing. Amen. Your family is another thing. In my family, I got plenty to pray about. I'm praying, I'm walking back and forth and I'm talking to God. Sharon told me to come out and check on me the other night. She thought I might have fell dead at the furnace. Amen. Praise God. She said, you all right? I said, yeah, I'll be in there in a minute. I'm just talking to God. It's cold, I know, I keep my hat on. I don't want my brain to freeze up in the middle of my prayer. Praise God. I'm just talking to God. I said, God, I need you. And I'm telling you plainly, just like that, a voice spoke to me and said, where's God at now? Lost something, boy. And in and, and, and a flash, a year ago, God moved miraculously in my life. And that voice said, remember that? I knew where it was coming from. He said, where's he at now? I said, the same place he's always been split foot. Now, I'm going to tell you something. God ain't moved. Charlie Rose is the one that might have moved. But I'm going to find out where I'm at. And I'm going to get to where I need to be. And then you're going to lose again. And I went back to the house almost 12 o'clock at night, whistling and carrying a five-gallon bucket. What you got in the bucket? Nothing. I carry it back empty. Praise God. What's it for? None of your business. Praise God. Hey, 
come in. No struggle. No struggle means death. I asked Sister Ruby, it's about her uncle. She's telling me all the things that they're doing. You know what he's doing? He's struggling. The doctors are struggling to save his life. He's struggling to live. You know what happens when he quits struggling? You know what happens when he quits? They die. What's true in the natural is true in the spiritual. Let me hurry. Praise God. I want to tell you, this church is not just a preaching place. Amen. This place is a body. Somebody say body. The church is a body that God lives in. I don't have to come to church. No, you don't. You can stay dead. Amen. I've already said there's excuses. There's sometimes people can't be here. There's sicknesses. There's illnesses. There's different things that happen. That's why we need to attend church. I come to this church because God's alive on the inside of, of Judy Anglin. Jesus is alive inside of Tommy Rattler Valley. Brother Freddie, Brother Tommy, Brother Ricky, are you listening to me? Jesus is alive in them. If Jesus is alive in the place, I want to be where Jesus is alive. Praise God. That's why I attend church. Man, I want to tell you something. I want to choose to march in the hot sand in spite of the devil. In spite of the devil. There's always a chorus. He doesn't have faith to deliver himself down in Egypt. But he gets out there. He's out of the slave camp now. And everybody's going to Uncle Cora. Well, I'll just tell you. Well, I'd like to have a dollar for every time I've heard this in Brotherton. Oh, Brother Rose, it's okay. He's a good man in his own way. But if I was pastor, I'll tell you now, things would sure be different. They sure would. Praise God. Sure would. I had a couple come out here on the parking lot not too long ago looking for a church. I said, well, what are you hunting for? Never forget this. Very nice people, very nice ride. She had plenty of diamonds. Yeah. Praise God. Said they knew the Lord. I said, what are you looking for? They said, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for a pastor that will not preach over 20 minutes. We're looking for a church that will have control over that pulpit. 18 to 20 minutes for anybody is long enough. Now, I don't know this woman. This is for I had met her husband once before. And by meeting him, he brought her because I'm a preacher. And they said, if you can guarantee us, even visiting preachers won't go over 18 or 20 minutes. And she said, that's right. Boy, she got mean, and I really, I'm not sure, but I believe I know who the Antichrist sister is. She said, God can get his point across in 20 minutes, and anybody that's going over that don't know God. I said, it is very good visiting with you folk. I really believe that you need to pray hard about ever deciding to join up at this church. She looked at me. I said, that's right, little lady. I said, I really believe that you're going to be driving too far to come here. I was glad there was at least one church between me and them. I said, cause I'm going to tell you something. I'm never going to write you that guarantee. I'm preaching for the audience of one folk. And it ain't that lady sitting back there with the diamonds. Amen? I'm preaching for the audience of one. Tommy Dumford had better minister for the audience of one. And that's not Pastor Rose. Amen? Audience of one. Oh, Brother Cora, he's got all the ideas. He can't deliver himself, let alone the rest of the church. Amen. He gets into that desert, and he's got all the answers. <sighs> I've had my fill of those Coras. God's chosen called Moses, but in the heat of the battle, 
They, they turn to him who promises ease, not to Moses, but to Korah. A, let me tell you something, friends. What's true in the Bible is true today. A slave will never deliver a slave. Never. God's requirement to me and you as Christians is this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A man that is going to increase in faith is never going to put a time limit on, on Brother Tommy, never going to put a time limit on me, never going to put a time limit if I invite Jimmy Swagger. Amen. Never put a time limit on him. I'm telling you, no time limits on anybody. I've got to have my faith increase. Amen. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Chorus trying to tell them how the church ought to be run. I get sick of people trying to tell me how the church ought to be run. I thought I'd bring this to you because you are the pastor. I just want you to know that these people are coming to your church and here's what you ought to do. Here's the situation. Here's what you ought to do. I'm not telling you what to do, but here's what you ought to do. Korah's out in the middle of the desert. He's telling everybody what Moses ought to be doing. You know one of the worst things that Sharon's ever had to deal with? is some old maid in the church that's never had a child trying to tell her how to raise our kids. I don't care how many books you read. I don't care. Until you raise the kid, whether yours or somebody else's, if you've raised that kid and put it into practice. Going to really be able to give any advice. Y'all remember that old cat by the name of Dr. Spock? I ain't talking about Star Trek. Wrote that book, Child Psychology. Almost 20 years later, before the old fella gave up the ghost, I think he did give up the ghost, didn't he? I think that's where I read this. He said, I hope the people of the world forgive me. I am guilty. I am guilty of causing America to raise a whole tribe of pure heathens. I ain't going to stood right back there in that foyer. Little old kids and me. I mean, I look up in the dictionary and he's grinning at me while I look up mean kid. He walks right up. His daddy's standing there. Says they're going to try to make their home here. I sent him to Kentucky. Because they had some kin people in Kentucky. I did. Praise God. I come in here. We were having homecoming. I heard a racket. And they were up there throwing shoes at the chandeliers. See if they could get one caught in. He was a preacher. His wife was a child psychologist. Little old rascal about the size of Sam walks up and kicked the fire out of his daddy. I seen his eyes turn white. Oh God, did that make did that make baby feel good? You want to kick me again? Wham! Kick Daddy again. I said, Don't do that no more. He drew back at to kick me. I grabbed my belt, started to take it off. I said, You kick this old preacher. I'll whip you. I said, And if your daddy gets in, I'll whip him as he's going off the parking lot. I said, You're not pulling that here. Amen. His little sister come up. She's the one that done got on through for throwing the shoes in the chandelier. I said, I told you you're not going to get it over on him. You might daddy, but not him. I'm going to tell you something now, folk. <laughs> Praise God. I just thought y'all be interested in that. Amen. Cora, trying to tell them. Amen. Oh, there's so much advice from faithless preachers. Here's the way we did it back in 1962. Did it work? No, but we survived. I don't want you to survive. Down in Egypt, Korah's not got any answers. Amen. He's out in the middle of the desert and thinks he's got answers. I believe that Moses was kept over in Midian for 40 years to get all the slavery mentality out of his heart. God's trying to change me and you from slaves of this world unto victors that are marching ahead for the glory of Almighty God.
I invited one of my friends to church. He says, I'm still praying, Brother Rose. I got quiet, and he said, what is it? I said, I'm just thinking about something Brother Clinton and said years ago. It's a horrible, horrible day when you have to beg people to go to heaven. You have to beg people to go to heaven. What a terrible time Moses had because of the type of people that wanted seemingly the safety of the slave camp. Preacher, we need salvation. Only Jesus saves. If you're going to become a disciple of his, you've got to do what the book says you've got to do. Amen. When a man meets Jesus, not religion, he's radically changed. Paul gets a good start. I mean, that man, he's a murdering Saul. He turns into a preaching Paul. That's what grace will do for you. Paul gets a good start and John Mark leaves him. Demas forsakes him. Amen. He's not out of the will of God. The church at Galatia one time would have plucked their eyes out and given them to him. Now they want to kill him. He's not out of the will of God. He's become a villain because he told them the truth. When you cry for the food of Egypt, what is it, preacher? It's unbelief. They listen to people who were slaves themselves. They have no record of faith. There's a day coming, folks, and I believe this, that we are in the desert, believe it or not. We're just kind of in an oasis right now. But the fires of the desert are coming. They're going to try us. I believe that. Amen. We've got to stand the heat and the test if we're going to rule in the kingdom to come. We got to stand the test of the desert if we're going to rule in the kingdom to come. What are you going to do? I don't know. But I'm doing my best to be as faithful as I can because I want to rule with him. He's going to rule this earth with a rod of iron. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of God and of his son, Christ Jesus. Wow. If I don't rule in this world, I'll never rule in the eternal world. Preacher, people will leave you with preaching like that. 33,000 left Gideon, but he with 300 won a victory. Amen. He went on. That's a pretty good chunk of your congregation, God. Just because things are going wrong don't mean that you're in the wrong. Hell's going to test everything to see what it's made out of. The biggest mistake is to do absolutely nothing. Problems come because you're doing what's right. Moses is facing problems from a roving band in the desert. No, his problems was not from the roving bands. That did happen one time that we've got a record of. Moses' problems was from within. I can tell you this. In 29, it would be 29 years, February the 10th. 28, 29 years, four years. February the 10th, we're closed. Celebrating. 29 full years, 29 years I've been here. Very little opposition has ever come to this ministry, this church, from outside this church. And if it has come from outside this church, 99% of the time it has been from people that profess Jesus Christ. Yeah. Profess. Praise God. I want to tell you something. <laughs> Most of the time, it ain't from somebody else. It's from old brother Toad Frog. Old brother Cold Blood. I'm pointing over here because ain't nobody sitting over there right now. Amen. He's sitting on the pew. Amen. He's looking for security. I just want him to be secure, but forget him. That cat ain't going to never do nothing. He's a nobody in the kingdom of God. Why? He's got Egypt in him. Amen. Our only answer. What is it, preacher? I got a cloud to follow during the day and I got a fireball to follow during the night. Amen. That's my only security. Who's in it? Christ Jesus is in it. Amen. 
<laughs> preacher called me and said, Preacher, I'm in over my head. I said, Swim, boy, swim. Praise God. Amen. Where'd you get that? Been there, done that. I told the fellow I was in over my head. He said, Can you dog paddle? He said, If you can't swim, dog paddle, boy, dog paddle. I remember that advice. Just pass it on. Praise God. How deep the waters. Amen. I want to tell you something. There is a place. You can stay knee deep if you want to. I ain't after knee deep. I ain't after waist deep. I ain't after chest deep. I'm after deep, deep. I'm after the deep, deep, deep. Praise God. That's where you find where the glory of God has never been tapped into yet. Praise God. Adrian Rogers said this, a faith that has never been tested is a faith that can never be trusted. Never met Adrian. I've got a lot of his sermons, and I've picked a lot of great wisdom from that Southern Baptist preacher. That's one of the great heroes of the Southern Baptist Church, isn't it, Miss Laura Adrian Rogers? Yeah. Amen. Ask your daddy. He'll know. Praise God. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you. Brother Mike Graham was talking to me a while back, and I went to Croak and Adrian Rogers, and he lit up. I said, yeah, he's a great man. You didn't know a holy roll to study him, did you? Praise God. I'll read. A faith that cannot be, that's never been tested, cannot be trusted. Paul's beaten stone, left for dead. He's down, but he's not out. He gets up and takes right off back where he was left. Before the Soviet Union, I'm going to conclude. Before the Soviet Union fell. It was putting people in prison. I've got a little booklet, Shackled for Jesus. I read it every now and again. And the guy was preaching, and he said, if they, they told us that while we were in prison, they worked them 12 hours, hard labor, give them watered-down soup to live on. They wanted them really to die, but they couldn't just outright kill them, I guess. They didn't want to. They'd rather torture them. But if you was a Christian... In countries in the Middle East today, if you profess Christianity and you become a minister, it's automatically 20 years hard labor in prison. Automatically. Today. Not 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Today. By the way, that bear has not changed. That's not a white polar bear. That is the black bear of Russia. And she's the same old bear. She's going to do what God says she's going to do because God said, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and I'm going to bring you down on the, the mountains of Israel and I'm going to plead with you there. And there's only going to be a few of y'all getting back to where you come from. Same thing with Red China. God's going to plead with him. He said, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw. You here tonight on the news that Russia with the federation of what Ezekiel said was coming, and they've invaded Israel. You don't need to get mad. You don't need to go join the army. They ain't going to take you no way. Amen. What you need to do is get your shouting shoes on. And you better get prayed up. Amen. If nothing else, get your family and go out in the backyard and start doing rapture practice. And jumping straight up there as high as you can jump because it's coming soon. Amen. God said, I'm going to put a hook in their jaw in those last days and bring them down. That old boy was in prison and the guards told him said if we hear you preaching it's a beating and he said I was preaching to the inmates we didn't know the guards was around he said here come the guards grab me beat me almost to death he said I came back they wiped some blood said we better be quiet he said where was I at when I stopped and they told him he said alright now I'm going to start from there amen went ahead and finished his sermon that's Paul's blood there. Amen. Beat him, drag him out of Lystra, leave him for dead. Amen. They're around crying, wondering if they're going to cremate him or bury him. Amen. Paul raises up. Amen. They're scared half to death, thought the dead come back to life. Amen. He's had a vision when he's out of there. He's been called up into the third heaven, and he's seen things. He said, I'm in the paradise of God. What was it like, Paul? Can't tell you. I saw things that came. 
The very people right now that's making a mock of Jesus Christ and the Supreme Court justices that have shook their fist against God and the stupid people that we've elected in office that's made a mockery are getting ready to bow at the feet of the King of Kings and are going to cry before they do to the rocks of the mountains. Amen. McDowell County will be unindated with a bunch of idiots that's going to come and say, where's an abandoned coal mine I can go into and pray for the rocks to fall on us and have Hide us from his face. Praise God. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Preacher, you ought not call people idiots. What do you want me to call them? The Bible calls them fools. Amen. In one hour, listen to me. I don't know where your treasure lies. I don't know where you spend your money or hide your money. But in one hour, the world system of monetary value that is called spiritually Babylon in the book of Revelation, in one hour, she falls. She falls in one hour across the face of this earth. Praise God. Amen. Merchants sweep. And she burns. You believe that's New York? Could be. I think it's the whole world system myself. I think it's going to be a whole thing. You can go back to Egypt if you want to, but I want to tell you, I prefer life in the spirit. Yeah. Praise God. I prefer life in the spirit. For the dead are raised where the sick are healed, where sinners are saved, and where the demonic are delivered. I prefer the experience and the thrill of the presence of Jesus Christ. Mr. Lawrence. Wasn't it St. Lawrence? Practicing the presence of God. I'm looking for some of y'all. Y'all ain't read that either. I've got two books on it. Practicing the presence of God. Brother Lawrence, that was it. We thought he was a, a saint, it wasn't St. Lawrence, it was Brother Lawrence. And he said, practice being in God's presence all the time. If you're working on your car. Anyway, of course, back in his day, he said, if you're working on your wagon, amen, while you're greasing the wheel, talk to God. Amen. That's what I do. I'm going here and going there. Amen. I pray about everything. Praise God. I go to the flea market. I pray for a good deal while I'm walking around. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> I've learned not to pray too much for Sharon for a good deal. I don't know if I got the truck big enough to haul it all back. Praise God. Amen. But I, I prefer, amen. I want, I, I, I want his presence. God's trying to take us out of Egypt. Come out from among them, saith God, and be ye separate. Verses like touch not, taste not, handle not. Commandments and doctrine in you. God spoke this to my heart this evening. He said, Son, if you fail in this hour, it would be better if you never existed. What's good for me is good for you. Son, if you fail in this hour, failure. I'm not talking about anybody in this church. I said it with some people that came. I had another guy came to me about 15 years ago. He said, if you promise me you'll get us out of here at 12 o'clock every Sunday, I'll bring 30 people with me. It was from a church split. Now, how in the world stupid would I be to invite 30 people to splitting off of another church that wasn't happy? It already got this guy to take them back to Egypt and thought they found a place right between them and Egypt, and that was the family worship center been the dumbest thing I could have ever done. I said, can I give you a list of all the other churches around? He looked at me. He said, I'm not interested. Praise God. Amen. Why? 20 of them went back to the church that they had left. Amen. The other 10 ain't going nowhere. Some of them dead. Amen. 
Son, if you fell in this desert hour, it would be better if you never existed. Here's the deal, friends. What will Charlie Rose be? I may die before the rapture. Oh, boy, I don't promise it tomorrow. Praise God. Well, preacher, you've lost some weight. You should be feeling better. I am. My health's bad. It's going to make it easier on the pallbearers, if nothing else. I don't know when I'm going. Amen. What's my life going to consist of when it all burns down? If Sharon's got enough money left over for, for a tombstone, if you don't, get Al and a hammer and chisel and tell him to write some stuff. I don't know. It's up to y'all what y'all want to write on the bottom of my tombstone. I did read this true story. It said this old guy was in a certain place and kept complaining. Everybody said, you're just a hypochondriac. Well, he died. And in his will, they found out, and he had it put on the bottom of his tombstone. He had his tombstone picked out, and he said, I told you all I was sick. That's why I put it on the bottom of the tombstone. That's all his life burned down to. My death. All the arteries are finished. My heart beats is finally beat. The muscles are wore out. This magnificent brain quits to function. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. Praise God. What am I going to burn down to? What's going to be left for her? All of us are living for something. Every one of you are living for something. Years ago, we used to sing an old song. I'm bound for the promised land. Y'all remember that? We used to sing that all the time in church. I'm bound for the promised land. Praise God. Brother Clint did and say, just a little bitty fella. And he said he started going to church. Mommy and daddy let some neighbors take him to church. And he said they sing that song. I'm bound for the promised land. He said he went for two or three weeks and said the Sunday school teachers taught him about Moses coming out of Egypt and he's going into the promised land. He said, I got to want me. He said, and then one old dear sister got up and sang a song. We're camping in Canaan's land. He said, I punched my little old fat sister and said, sis, we've arrived. We've got to Canaan. He said, I'm just a little bitty fella. Praise God. I'm waiting until I can sing it on the shores. Amen. Not only my camp, but I'm home. I'm home at last. Praise God. It's a lot easier. The devil don't fight you as hard. In the safety of the slave camp. Nobody really gets mad at you. People get mad and start casting my name out as evil. I comfort myself with the scripture, woe unto the man that is well spoken of by everybody. <laughs> Praise God. It's been a few times. I'm bored. God, I'm doing great. Well, I don't think everybody likes me. Praise God. God is so good. God, I thank you for these people. I really thought that I was only going to preach short time tonight and I know I've gone a while but as I said that's between you and everybody else if I'm your vessel I've obeyed you and I believe I've obeyed you tonight God I thank you for faithful people I thank you that there's people here tonight that are not worried about anything else but you that's why they're here that's why they're God, I thank you. And I ask you, God, that there be not one person in here that's going to miss the rapture. If there's anything in their lives, you need to deal with them, God. I'm asking you to deal with them. 
If they won't listen to the Holy Spirit, then lay a burden on Tommy to preach on it or myself or Johnny Cooper or whatever. Because the end resolve is our souls are important. I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. If my feet's got to burn for a while, let them burn. If my bald head's got to get sunburnt and peel, let it peel. If I got to wade through the fiery serpents, let me wade through the fiery serpents. If I got to drink bitter water, let me drink it because I've got my eyes and sight set on a little cold country stream between two hills that's flowing down off of those hills. And my house is set up there and I'm watching the cattle get fat. And I'm watching the grapes turning ripe in the sun. I love grape pines. I love vineyards. I love grape arbors. I'm watching the figs get ripe on the fig tree and I've got the recipe to make fig newtons. I'm excited about Canaan's land. I'm excited about going to Canaan's land. I'm excited about a tree that grows on either side of that great river that I can't swim across. It's a huge tree. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Wow. Wow. The fruit whew, out of this world. I'm heading. Wow. A while ago, I looked back. Right now, I'm looking forward. Whew. Praise God. You know, in heaven, we're neither going to be married or given in marriage. I don't get to be married, Sharon, in heaven. You see, you don't get to be married to nobody else. And I've said, God, she's been awful good to me. Let her little old farm be right next to mine. Praise God. She loves cattle. I love horses. I'll go over and do a glass of buttermilk, sit and talk about the old days. Amen. I love you. I appreciate you in Jesus' name. If you want prayer, I'll pray for you. Testify, I'll listen to it. You want to sing a song? I'll hum with you. If you want to give a donation, I'll hand it to Miss Wendy. Praise God. It's been good to be in the house of God.